All right, so we are going to move on to our last session of the day. Um, we've been talking about this indoor chemistry things and indoors happens to happen inside a space we call buildings. And so we're gonna focus on the building, this last aspect um, in this last session today. Um, and our primary speaker here will be Jeff Siegel. He is a professor of civil and mineral engineering and a member of the Hub Advancement of Buildings at the University of Toronto. And kind of as an indication of the inter, yeah, interdisciplinary nature of the field, Jeff is um, the Banham, Banham Tantenbaum Chair in Civil Engineering, but also has joint appointments in the Dalla Lana School of Public Health and the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences. Um, he has a PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and when I first met the ponytailed Jeff uh, 20 years ago at the University of Texas at Austin, he was strongly committed to, let's say, um, inserting science into the air cleaning market, which uh, I do all the time now. So either Jeff was a trailblazer in this field or he didn't finish the job very well. Um, but it must be the former because he um, he's a real uh, internationally recognized expert as both a member of the ASHRAE and ISIAC Fellows. Um, and as one of his colleagues stated today, Jeff is one of the most knowledgeable, thoughtful, insightful speakers in the field of building science and indoor air quality. And while he wasn't an author on the NASM report, he was an author, uh, sorry, the NASM report on why indoor chemistry matters. He was an author on the health risks of indoor exposure and fine particulate matter and practical mitigation solutions. And their book is bigger, so it must be better. Um, and they have practical solutions, unlike us. We just say, well, it doesn't matter. Um, so um, Jeff's research interests include healthy and sustainable buildings, filtration, air cleaning, ventilation, control, particular matter, and the cognitive impacts of indoor air quality. And going back to Glenn's questions this morning, what motivates Glenn? I, start I have no idea what motivates Glenn. <laughs> but I have a hint to what might motivate future research from Jeff and then talking to him he started to think more and more about the environmental uh, justice issues surrounding indoor air quality. So with that, I'd like Jeff to finish Jeff's introduction and have him finish off this session. So uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously there's been some great presentations and panels already this morning. And I will comment that, uh, you know, I wish I could have come up with a clever title, but uh, Madonna's uh, building science phase is not very well known. So, uh, so there it is. So I want to start with an example that is very simple compared to much of the chemistry that's been discussed today and uh, the chemistry that's discussed in the report. And uh, this is some recent data we've collected. And what you see here are two plots of uh, the performance of two different air cleaners, uh, a not very good one on the left and a, and a better one on the right. And uh, these are in five different environments measured over a two week period. And so what you see on the, the x-axis there is the effectiveness or, or how much uh, those, those uh, air cleaners are reducing the concentration of PM 2.5 in the space. And there is, one conclusion from this that has come out in, in, in several talks today that I think is really important, the environment really matters. You see a very different performance of the very same air cleaners when they're used in different environments. I don't think that will surprise people very much other than it kind of starts to build the case here for the uh, complexity and the differences of different environments. But there's something else that I think is equally important in these plots, and that's the width of some of these distributions. And again, this is over a relatively short time scale, two weeks in each of these environments, and you see a huge distribution of the effectiveness in many of these environments. So the very same air cleaner in the very same environment can perform very differently uh, at, at different times. And I think that tells us a lot of what we need to be thinking about for indoor chemistry. So fundamentally, indoor chemistry is driven by the context, and the context, because it's indoors, is, is partially shaped by the building. And so if you can kind of go through all the major parts of the report, the, the building is going to influence things. So what I want to do today is talk about 
some examples of how the building influences things and what I think that means uh, for some of the recommendations in the report. So if we kind of think about this idea of, you know, this is chemistry indoors, at least for this presentation, this is about the indoors where chemistry happens. And so kind of briefly an overview, I'm gonna talk about some important things in buildings, I call them systems, but I guess some of them are, some of them aren't, but, but and, and how they're important to indoor chemistry and how we can characterize or measure them. And that's a big theme of, of what I'm gonna talk about today. And then what does that mean in terms of the recommendations from the report? So fundamentally, uh, I believe to, to, if you wanna understand or manage indoor chemistry, you need to understand the building. And the three uh, systems I'm gonna talk about today are ventilation, uh, surfaces, and HVAC systems. And I wanna make the comment right at the start that there's in fact lots of other systems, uh, uh, especially the people in those buildings and some of the other things that go on in buildings that are really important too, but um, I have the time I have. And so these are the three. I've chosen to focus on. So I think everyone has a basic concept in their mind about ventilation. Ventilation is the uh, replacement of indoor air with outdoor air. Usually we kind of divide it into two bins, the uh, mechanical ventilation bin. That means it's driven by a fan uh, and there's lots of different kinds of mechanical ventilation. You could be uh, exhausting, like from a kitchen range hood or a bathroom, or you could be supplying uh, with a ventilation system. Uh, you could have a balance system that both exhausts and supplies. You can integrate it with the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. That's what the V and H HVAC is. And of course, it can be controlled or scheduled by the operation of the building and, 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 and often is. So that's mechanical ventilation. And then there's a term that we use a lot of different words to describe it. I'm gonna call it leakage. And all it is is uh, uh, air that comes from the outside in uh, or the other way around uh, that's not driven by a fan. And uh, this can be intentional. You can open a window to get natural ventilation uh, uh, or it could just be leakage through the building enclosure where, and it's gonna be driven, all leakage is driven by some sort of pressure difference caused by commonly things like wind, the inside outside temperature difference, or what people like me call the stack effect, uh, or pressures that are induced by the, the HVAC system and drive some of those ventilation flows. The, the comment that's, that's, that's made in the report and is kind of important to say is that from an indoor chemistry perspective, uh, ventilation is going to increase the concentration of things that originate outdoors, and it's going to decrease the concentration of things that originate indoors. But I think really important for, for chemistry processes, and many people have made this, this, the, this point uh, 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 in the literature, is that the time scale for ventilation is really what's important. Uh, and in particularly when uh, uh, ventilation is relatively low, we have the opportunity for a lot of chemistry to happen that might not happen at times when the ventilation is higher. Uh, one of the earliest long-term measurements of ventilation rate that I know of uh, was done by Lance Wallace and colleagues in, in Reston, Virginia, in his home in Reston, Virginia, uh, uh, not too far from here. Uh, they, they did uh, uh, measurements over the course of a year um, with uh, SF6, successive SF6 decays. Um, so this is like uh, uh, kind of the cause of climate change uh, 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 here. And uh, the point I wanna make is the, is the dynamic uh, nature of it. So over the course of the year, almost 5,000 measurements of the air exchange rate, you can see certainly a central tendency somewhere on the order of you know, 0.4 uh, or so uh, air changes per hour. But you see, again, this distribution. There are times when it's much higher and times when it's relatively low. And, and I think that that is, is really a, a really important point and one that, that, that you know, it might be driven by, for example, the inside outside temperature difference. Uh, the wind at this particular site tended to be higher in the uh, uh, early afternoon. Uh, uh, that drives some of the variation. Of course, things like windows open uh, also uh, drove some of the variation here. 
So this variation occurs and uh, it shows up in, in more modern work as well. I think we've seen uh, some other uh, data from this house today. This is a house in, in, in California. This was work done by Lou uh, uh, with uh, Alan Goldstein and Bill Nazaroff. And uh, what they did is they measured the uh, flows, not only between the inside and the outside, but between different parts of, of, this, of this home. And two points I wanna make. One is that um, uh, you know, it's dynamic. They did measurements at different times and you see different flows at different times. But the other thing is that in this particular building, there is a fairly consistent pattern of flow that a lot of the indoor air comes from the crawl space and uh, a lot of the indoor air goes to the attic. And so if we think about some of the things that have been discussed today, if you're interested in what might be influencing some of the concentrations of compounds in this house, it might be related to chemistry that occurs in a crawl space, which is I think very different from a lot of the indoor spaces we tend to think about. And if you're interested in the impact that indoor compounds have on outdoor air, they might be moderated by things that go on in the attic, which is another space we don't usually think about as an indoor space, but uh, can be important. And I'm gonna return back to attics a little bit later today. Well, the problem with the, or, or a challenge with the, those two results that I just showed you was that they're quite intensive, uh, take a lot of, of resources and so on. And now we have low cost sensors. And so is there easier ways to kind of get at the dynamics of ventilation rate? So this is some work by Carrillo, who is a Brazilian researcher who used indoor and outdoor carbon dioxide measurements and a signal processing approach to assess the air exchange rate shown uh, over a week uh, uh, in his apartment. And uh, you can see that over very short time scales, the shaded periods are, are, are nighttime, the, the, the light periods are daytime, but you see over very short time periods, these, this variation in the, in the air change rate, quite large variations, factors of three or four over relatively short time scales. And so it kind of gets to the importance of if you're studying something with indoor chemistry, you really have to think about these dynamics. And uh, uh, others have taken this further. This is some work that, that Massey Alavi uh, did uh, where took the same approach and uh, applied it to uh, uh, a year of data from, from my house in Toronto. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, again, over the course of a year, you see this very wide variation in, in air change rate. And um, uh, you can start to understand why measuring the air exchange rate at one moment in time um, can, can, can lead to misleading results. This type of approach, signal processing, is dependent fundamentally on, on making a decision about what signal and what's noise. And that's kind of a, a, an art more than a science. And so uh, more recently, Bo and Du uh, did some uh, uh, work where looking if we could use machine learning techniques to take a trace from a low cost sensor, uh, in, in, in this case of CO2, but you can do it for, for anything you have a, a measurement of, and use that machine learning approach to find periods of decay and, uh, and analyze those for the air change rate. So when he applied it to the same data set uh, from my house, uh, uh, that same CO2 data set, you can see that the decay rate over the course of the year shows very similar to what I've shown you before, uh, that there's a lot of variation over time, uh, uh, including some you know, quite high air exchange rates, presumably times when windows are open. And so um, my bigger picture point here is that you know, this does happen and it is measurable and it is measurable with um, relatively straightforward techniques and low cost sensors. So, uh, you know, ventilation is, is, is important for, for indoor chemistry in a number of ways. Uh, and, and I think that's worth saying, but ventilation is also really dynamic and has multiple pathways when it, when it happens. So you need to be thinking about what ventilation you're measuring and how you're measuring it. And also we need to, this came up a little bit in the discussion after Delphine's talk, we really need to think about some of the processes that can happen 
to compounds in air while ventilation is occurring. One example of that is uh, this paper by Zhao et al. from uh, Brent Stevens group that looked at the what happens to uh, NOx when it goes from the uh, outside to the inside and presumably the other way as well. And you can see that something like NO penetrates more or less completely from the outside to the inside, but uh, NO2 is lost as it goes from the, the, the outside to the inside. And so we have to start thinking it's not just the amount of air and the amount of contaminant in that air, it's what might be uh, happening in terms of transformation. Um, I said ventilation summary, but I wanna get a little bit more advanced on ventilation because there's another piece of ventilation that even in the building science community, we don't talk about enough, uh, but is enormously important. And that air movement kind of within and between zones is or rooms in a space is, is really, really important. And so uh, this is some work that Doug Collins did uh, uh, when he was in John Abbott's group doing a Hono perturbation experiment in the kitchen. And basically what you see is uh, uh, a lot of the, the chemistry involving Hono is happening certainly in the kitchen, uh, but also in the rest of the house. And so all of a sudden we have to start thinking about, about this idea of interzonal flows. Uh, I show this picture here from an older paper, but um, it was done in the same house that, that home chem was done in. And the home chem house is interesting for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it's really interesting is it's the only time I've ever had done or seen any testing in a building where the wind direction is so consistent uh, from one direction. Generally, you see a, a huge variation and that affects the distribution of contaminants and the air flows within the space. And one last point I wanna make uh, is that um, as we think a lot about some of the equity issues and think about the kinds of spaces that people actually live uh, in buildings, we will be talking about multifamily uh, buildings. And multifamily buildings, there is a certain amount of shared air between different units and multifamily buildings. This plot is from a review uh, paper by Carl Lazinski and Marianne Tushi, where they showed things like, based on a review of the literature, that building construction type. There's certainly a lot of variation, but affects how much air is shared uh, between, between apartments. And from an indoor chemistry perspective, uh, when you do have attached dwellings or attached uh, spaces of, of any kind, you're going to see some of the uh, impact of chemistry, uh, both in terms of, 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 of reactants and, and products that, that, that go between uh, units. And that's another kind of level of ventilation we should be thinking about. I'm gonna say the least in this presentation about surfaces, not because surfaces are not important, but because there's lots of people in this room who can talk about surfaces uh, uh, a lot more um, uh, cogently and completely than I can. But I do want to say some things about surfaces from kind of a building science perspective. And uh, obviously we've heard and the report makes clear just how important surfaces are to, to indoor chemistry and that indoor spaces have a lot of surface area. And the, there is this, this other thing that surfaces have an underlying substrate underneath them, sometimes a very complex substrate, uh, but then they also have a, a film or a layer or a coating that, that, that changes over time and is quite dynamic, uh, depending on uh, what its constituents are. And, and the prior history of a surface, which we almost never know in real buildings, is very, very important potentially to what chemistry that surface might uh, might 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 uh, uh, that surface might play a role in, and the one point that I think is so important about surfaces is most of the surfaces in a building are not seen. Most of the surfaces in a building are things that that we don't think about. So certainly there are things like carpet, like in the top image, that obviously has a much bigger surface area than its projected surface area, even kind of a, a low pile carpet. Uh, but the bottom figure is from Chin et al. in, uh, in, in Elliot Gall's group and shows the uh, reaction and the products that are produced uh, by ozone reaction with various insulation materials. And uh, you can see that there is the insulation material 
uh, uh, first of all, can a lot of insulation materials react a lot with ozone, uh, and that also they're producing a different fingerprint of byproducts. So again, a phenomenal amount of surface area uh, uh, associated with, with, with materials, some of which we see directly, uh, others less so. There's also what, what I call interstitial spaces, things like attics, drop ceiling spaces, crawl spaces, spaces in walls. And those both have a lot of surface area, but they also have a lot of potential for relatively interesting chemistry. So the picture on the top is in fact, the only picture I've ever seen of something that happens in almost every building in North America almost every day. And that is the underside of the roof deck uh, produces condensation. That's because it's cold overnight. The roof deck gets cold, warm, moist air from inside uh, condenses on that uh, uh, in the early morning. And so if water is important to the chemistry and you've got uh, 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 air either coming from the attic to the building or, or going from the, the, the building to the attic uh, or both, as is often the case, uh, you're going to see some interesting chemistry. And then buildings like the one we're in have, you know, just these phenomenal number of spaces that uh, uh, we never think about. They're above uh, above drop ceilings or or in in mechanical areas or other things that that can have a lot of surface area and can be uh, important to chemistry that we probably don't ever think about. And then the the last surface unseen surface that's kind of near and dear to me is the HVAC uh, surface and HVAC systems just have phenomenal surface areas associated with the ducts themselves as well as uh, heat exchangers uh, filters uh, 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 things like that so really we have these surfaces where um, both there's this concentration of high surface area uh, and often uh, uh, dirty conditions and, and uh, sometimes extreme temperatures, humidities, other things. So from the perspective of building science, if you have a process where surfaces are important, I think that this community very much understands chemical characterization of surfaces, but also consider physical uh, and, and biological characterization uh, uh, in the mix. And in particular, I always like to talk about the role of water uh, and particularly adsorbed water on surfaces. So uh, uh, don't show any recognition if you don't want to reveal your age, but uh, if you think about popcorn ceilings, which had their uh, uh, popularity, uh, a popcorn ceiling is a very prime site for growing mold in a lot of buildings. And it's probably a very important site for chemistry as well, because you have each of those little valleys has a little collection of adsorbed water. Uh, and so again, there are these surfaces and indoors that we probably don't give a lot of thought to uh, that are, are, you know, no one's taken the time, but are likely important to, uh, to indoor chemistry. Uh, the last system I want to talk about are, are uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. Uh, they do a lot of different things in buildings. They're often, uh, when people talk about them, are accompanied by schematics, like the one you see here, where you have uh, you can bring in outside air with ventilation, you can heat and cool the air, you move the air with fans. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially in North America, we're kind of more used to this type of model, which is common certainly in most residences and, and, and most older residences, where you have uh, no outdoor air, the building gets its ventilation from leakage, uh, so you have a recirculating system. But this idea of, of a basic HVAC system is usually accompanied by this type of thought process where you know, the HVAC system is carefully designed to provide comfort, uh, maintain indoor air quality. It's, it's, it's installed by trained professionals and it's operated in an energy efficient manner. That's wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I wanna be clear, I'm not, I'm actually, I'm only a little bit knocking the HVAC industry here. This is more reflecting societal values. Uh, but uh, really, uh, this is probably a better description of HVAC systems. You know, they're designed using rule of thumb. They're definitely uh, 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 designed for the time of construction of the building, uh, very often uh, installed uh, by the least cost bidder. 
uh, especially if you spend time in schools, uh, but a lot of buildings, they're minimally maintained. Uh, and they often have significant control or failure. So from an indoor chemistry perspective, we're not that interested in the ideal system. We're interested in the actual system. And we've known that, that HVAC systems can be important for indoor chemistry for a long time. This is a review paper from uh, close to 30 years ago uh, that, that, that shows the many different ways that the HVAC systems can contribute to uh, indoor air quality issues and, and a lot of indoor chemistry potential there. Uh, here's some work from uh, Glenn's time as a PhD student looking at uh, uh, ozone reactions on, on uh, uh, ducts and duct components. Uh, and so, so these systems can be very important for indoor chemistry. So if we think about how do we characterize an HVAC system from the perspective we might care about in indoor chemistry, one of the things we care about is the recirculation, how many building volumes pass through the system. So the graph that's on the screen is from three different studies in three different parts of North America, all homes. And you can see this recirculation rate, how much air goes through the system when it's operating, ranges from a couple of, of home volumes per hour to about eight home volumes per hour. So there's this huge variation uh, uh, in systems, in HVAC systems. And you can measure this flow even in relatively complex systems, usually using something like a, an orifice flow plate uh, or some, some type of, of, of velocity measurement, but it's characterizable and is important to do given, given the variation you see. And this is important for indoor chemistry because it's another time scale that might be important for indoor chemistry. Uh, it also uh, is going to show uh, uh, how much connection there is between the HVAC system and the rest of the building. You might have some type of air cleaner that I said removal here, but could also be a source of things that you might care about from, from uh, uh, an indoor chemistry perspective, uh, how much it's going to contribute to mixing uh, and, and a variety of other issues. And uh, I'll come back to this point a little bit later, but you know, HVAC systems are also a site of, of extreme conditions. You have very hot temperatures near, near heating heat exchangers. You have liquid water in almost all cooling systems. Uh, and you have insanely large amounts of, of, of illumination uh, near UV lamps. And that was discussed earlier today. For systems that provide mechanical ventilation, another thing that's really important is how much of the air they're providing is outdoor air. And um, this is a surprisingly dynamic number. The data here are from a study we did in big box retail stores and you know, five different stores and they all have very different amounts of, of, of outside air coming in. And it doesn't really have a strong correlation to how much air they're moving uh, as well. And you can measure this doing a carbon dioxide split or, or a variety of other ways, but it turns out to be quite important to be able to uh, uh, assess how much outdoor air is actually being provided by a mechanical ventilation system. And I just wanna highlight that, 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 that this is really dynamic too. So most buildings modulate the amount of outdoor air uh, that's coming in, uh, depending on things like occupancy or, or a user schedule or something like that. Not only that, most HVAC systems do not operate continuously. They cycle on and off to meet conditioning, ventilation, uh, or, or other loads. And so these are data from about 7,000 homes, monthly averages for their runtime and, and the, the outdoor temperature. I showed these data a lot, and there are two points that are worth making. How often an HVAC system runs is very variable. You see some systems that run almost all the time, some that run very little. But the average number, and these data come from all over uh, US and Canada, is that, that faint red dashed line there at about 18%. And so this shows that if you're not measuring runtime, you could, uh, uh, you could be in a scenario where the HVAC system matters a lot or it matters very little. And so this is very important to measure. Lots of different ways of measuring runtime uh, out there, including more even that are on this list. 
uh, and it should be something that's kind of part of the indoor chemistry toolkit, given how important uh, it can be. And, you know, kind of everything that might happen with indoor chemistry is tied to the runtime. Uh, Barb already showed uh, this plot, uh, uh, and I want to uh, talk more about it because because this uh, is such an interesting uh, finding. Uh, uh, and you know, this shows the 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 cycling of um, the air conditioner and the removal, uh, uh, at least during periods when the air conditioner is operating, of some of these uh, organic acids, and. There are two points I want to make about this. The first is that, you know, you can predict this. We did a relatively simple model uh, of this uh, led by uh, Heather Schwartz and Arvon. And, uh, you know, using a very simple Henry's Law kind of approach, we could model with, you know, a factor of two or so accuracy uh, uh, this these, these uh, uh, removal rates. And, um, you know, so one thing is you can predict this, and so it's important to know when the coil is wet and when the fan is running and that sort of thing. Another point I want to make about this is that if you look at the magnitude of the removal rate, which is shown on the y-axis on the, the lower plot here, those are pretty big removal rates, uh, certainly larger often than ventilation uh, in buildings. So this could be a really important process uh, and one that I think needs more attention. The other thing I want to say about these data that, that I think is so important is kind of gets to some of the interdisciplinary aspects of this. And I had a slide about this and I took it out because I thought it went too much in the weeds, but I'm going to go into it anyway. The, um, the how we operate a cooling system is really important to how long that water stays on the coil. And so one of the things that's happened as we care a lot more about electricity use and energy efficiency is we make coils that have the fins for heat exchange that are closer together. When we do that, water drains more slowly off the coil. And so if this chemistry is, is important for a compound that you're interested in, uh, a more uh, energy efficient air conditioner is going to have more time for that chemistry to occur because the water is there for longer. Then the other thing that's interesting that we found out kind of by accident, and I still can't believe this is the case, but um, when you operate an air conditioner, the standard practice used to be that you would, when the thermostat uh, conditions were met, you'd shut off the compressor and the fan, partially to allow the water to drain. Now, uh, a lot of systems these days, again, in the nature of energy efficiency, keep the fan running after you shut the compressor off. What that means is that all the water that is sitting on that coil and sitting there for longer because the coil takes longer to drain, evaporates back into the air. And so if there is chemistry that, I mean, I don't know, uh, 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 that there's certainly a probably aqueous chemistry going on, but then are those compounds coming back into the air when that water evaporates? And so again, it kind of maybe gets into the weeds a little bit, but kind of highlights the importance of thinking about things like, is the coil wet? So uh, getting to the end here, uh, uh, if we get to the recommendations in the report, you know, indoor chemistry matters. If you look at the 15 recommendations, 11 of them explicitly include researchers, and the comment I would make to researchers is characterizing the building is, is often needed to understand the chemistry. If you characterize the building, you can often generalize chemistry results to other buildings that have uh, uh, some of those same features in common. And then another thing that, that, that I would comment on is this idea of extreme environments. James Scott, uh, uh, who's a mycologist and a colleague in public health, has this great quote from a Wired magazine article a while ago that points out that few places on earth get as hot as a rooftop or an attic, and few places on earth get as dry as the corner of a heated living room. And so really we're in the world of extremes. I would add UV to that list as well. Uh, uh, and so I think there's an opportunity for very interesting chemistry that probably occurs in indoor environments and nowhere else. Um, 
there is uh, several or three of the recommendations that address funders and funding agencies. And um, I have two messages here. One is, you know, I understand that you're predominantly interested in funding fundamental chemistry research, but I would say that building characterization should be a part of that to allow for the extension of that of that chemistry research. And uh, uh, we're not talking big dollars here. Most of the stuff I talked about today was done with low cost sensors or, or, or could be analyzed based on data that was being collected anyway. Um, there is a, a couple of the recommendations that address kind of building design standards uh, and, and, and a couple that address the importance of interdisciplinary collaborations. And just want to make the observation here that the impact that indoor chemistry will have on other fields will come from thinking about common language and, and about the contributions that, that other fields make. And I'm continually struck by the fact that um, building it, uh, operators and those who actually maintain buildings uh, are often not at the table when we're discussing some of this chemistry that is 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 very important. And so I think there are several populations like that that should be included. And I want to finish here by by making a global point, which is made in the report, and I think it really needs to be to be echoed. Uh, what this is is uh, filters that were collected in for a week uh, in uh, uh, social housing apartments in Toronto, uh, nine apartments in the same building, and the one with green tape is uh, blank. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't need to be an indoor chemist uh, or an indoor air quality expert to understand that, that there is different things in the air uh, in these environments. And I think that a big part of uh, convincing the world that indoor chemistry matters comes from being able to visualize it and make it clear uh, uh, what's going on, why the chemistry is important, and how do we kind of visualize that so that people can, can, can respond uh, to it. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, uh, thank you, Jeff. Fascinating talk. Um, what, one question I had was that uh, you talked a lot about how the, the dynamics of, of exchange between different rooms, between, um, uh, you know, indoors and outdoors. Um, something that is also very important is the, is the mixing that occurs within a particular room. Um, and I was wondering whether, you know, what, what research has been done on, on that question and the factors that affect uh, sort of, you know, the, the, the rates and the degree of mixing that happened within a particular space. Yeah, I mean, mixing is enormously important. I, I want to like, that's a great question. And it's actually surprising. There is lots of research that has kind of characterized mixing in different spaces, but we don't have a lot of fundamental research on mixing. And I think it is so important. And the easiest thing to do in an indoor chemistry experiment is, you know, to deploy some low cost sensors around the space to characterize some of the mixing. And I myself do, a, 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 like I can't look at a room and predict the mixing. In fact, I was sitting here earlier today and trying to understand where the supply and the return vents were and trying to understand mixing. But like one of the classrooms I teach in most commonly, um, it's only after we did some measurements in the room that we realized that the two supply registers were on either side of the return register. So all of the air supplied by the HVAC system just kind of went out and back in and then didn't, didn't go in the rest of the room. And so um, uh, uh, characterizing mixing is enormously important. Uh, and it is often competitive with ventilation in terms of dilution away from a point uh, in a space. Okay, uh, since you ran a little bit long, I think we will stop there. And because I lost rust, rock, paper, scissors to Charlie and Glenn, I am leading this last panel. Either that or they're picking on me because I'm the youngest. I'm not sure which. So if I could have the last panel members come on up and we will talk a little bit more about building sciences as we finish up this great workshop.
And as they are sitting down, I'd like to point out, I'm kind of excited that this, uh, other than that guy from Toronto, uh, everybody here is a public servant with federal or state organization. So we have some uh, governmental uh, opinions, hopefully, to, throughout today. Um, so I want to start off, just everybody introduce yourself. You get 21 seconds, uh, just who you are, where you're from, and what your major interests are. 21 seconds, go. Oh, uh, pressure's on. Uh, my name is Brian Gilligan. I'm a deputy director of the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings at GSA. I'm a mechanical engineer by background, but a recovering bureaucrat by uh, my major area of focus right now. Uh, interested in, in uh, green building policy and, and promoting high performance uh, green buildings. Um, I'm Odessa Gomez. I um, am a research affiliate at CU Boulder, and I also work at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Any views or opinions I have today are mine alone and not of the agency. <laughs> um, and I'm an environmental engineer, so I'm really interested in um, taking a lot of the building science we have here today and distilling it into actionable guidance. Hello, uh, I'm Dave Rousen. I'm the director of the Indoor Environments Division at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And um, I think the principal interests uh, I bring are around both um, promoting uh, and sometimes conducting uh, uh, research to uh, advance the foundational science around uh, what happens indoors uh, to um, promote, in the end, uh, uh, public health. And then the other side of, of that is uh, putting in place uh, programs uh, and uh, and communications and policies to uh, to equip both the buildings community, the health community, and uh, the general public to take effective action uh, to reduce risks. We'll skip. We'll skip you, Jeff. Yeah, I'll see my twenty one okay. seconds. Hi, I'm Brett Singer. I. I'm at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where I've been for quite a long time now, 26 years. Um, my interest, I'm, I'm an environmental engineer by training, and my interest is in how fundamental processes, physical chemical processes that uh, lead to exposure, uh, to lead to people being exposed to chemicals, play out in real buildings. So I'm really interested in a lot of the subjects that Jeff brought up and uh, were talked about today. Okay. Um... I actually want to start with you, Brett, because you sent me a sentence this morning that got me thinking, and I just want you to try uh, to, to give us a little background of what you meant by it. And basically, you sent me uh, this quote says, one person's indoor chemical trash is another person's life experience treasure. And I thought that was an interesting perspective to put some of this in context. So could you explain what you meant by that? Sure. Uh I, I took a fresh look at the report yesterday on the airplane, and I said, oh, let me just go back to the introduction. And... And one of the things that struck me is it dove right into hazards, chemical hazards. And, and, and this is something that Jeff and I both deal with as energy efficiency people, right? Where people who do building energy efficiency think that buildings were built to like consume energy, but they're not. They're built to protect people from the outside world and provide spaces for us to live and do things and have fun. And, and, and the chemicals that are in those buildings and the chemical processes are the result of all of the materials that we build into the building and put into the building for us to enjoy the buildings, the products that we use. So we 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 do these things. We have these exposures as a result of an an attempt to like you said better living through chemistry, right? And that says the first point is that we should not lose sight of that context, right? We talk we talk about some exposure, uh, you know, a terpene exposure or something. Well, a lot of people like that smell, so they're like intentionally bringing that into their house and gaining benefit from it. So when we talk about some hazard or risk, it should be in that context that remember that like, these are not things that people are, you know, it's like a life without risk is a very boring life, right? So people are doing things because they want to have experiences, number one. Number two, um, we talk about the changes and there's a lot of focus of, over changes that have happened over the past decade or two decades. Uh, my friend over here, uh, Charlie Wester wrote a great paper about changes in indoor uh, chemicals, whatever, since the 1950s. Right. And I think that that longer perspective is really important. Right. So, yes, there have been a lot of changes over the past two decades or so. But but a lot of first of all, that's not the first two decades that our indoor chemical environments have changed. They've been changing since we've had indoor chem, uh, indoor environments. Um, 
Number two, a lot of those changes are because we were trying to develop better products. We were trying to develop surfaces that are easier to clean or that would become moldy less frequently, or you know, there was some benefit, better filters, et cetera. Um, that being said, variability is huge, right? So there's a lot of talk about variability and, and I wanna bring up a couple of points. So it's not just uh, uh, the, the wonderful work showing variability within the same home, how much variability there is from room to room, even two people living in the same home, okay, terrific. Over time, we see variability in the chemical environment within the same space, just over the season over one day, you do different things in that space and you start going to different spaces. So variability, even within the same space, spatially, right? You should, uh, Professor Farmer shows this great picture of the engineering building, right? Even within that space, pretty simple space, not a lot of surfaces, but just even within that space, if you look at one part of that space, you're gonna see a very different chemical environment than another part of that space. So there's tremendous complexity, tremendous variability. Um, and it's it, it's constantly changing. That said, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. I have some more comments to, to your questions, but I just for the introduction, um, it, it seems like oh my gosh, it's so complex and it's always changing, whatever else. But I think that there there are general generalizable lessons that we can take, or there's there's general processes or general um, there there are common conditions, right? So Jeff showed some nice data residences especially within the US, you know, vary a lot less than residences differ from, let's say, classrooms or offices, okay? So there are sort of generalizable things you do about certain types of spaces, number one. Number two, um, while the materials are always changing, okay, and, and the environment's changing throughout the year, there are patterns every year. We know something about that. We know something about the range and temperature and humidity conditions. We know something about, the, the variations in HVAC, something about the variations in ventilation, and then the materials and the products that we have, while they are changing, most of the chemistry that's gonna happen in indoor spaces over the next decade or, or so is already set by the environments that are built today and by the products that we use today. Okay, so it's not an impossible task to learn some things that will be useful to us over, over a time scale that by the time we learn them, we can actually use them. It's only a minute and a half after you said, I'm gonna stop there. Um, so the next one, I go, go to Jeff and Odessa. And the, the question is, you know, we, we, we all are tasked with measure, seeking to make some measurements in the indoor space, what we call in general IAQ measurements. And in those measurements, we have different objectives. We have how the building operates, the chemistry, and then of course the health outcomes. So what really matters and how should we focus the limited funds we have when we make IAQ measurements? I think to, to add on to the what measurements that are out there, I think the access now to lower cost sensors is really important. Um, and I think more importantly, it's the training of those who look at the data on what they're looking at is really important. So taking the time to make sure that our facility managers understand what they're looking at and what actions to take next, specific next steps um, on how to handle um, issues that they might come across. Um, so I think in working with schools and deploying particle monitors and other CO2 VOC sensors out there. Um, that's been a big pushback from schools is what do we do with this data? How do we act on it? So I think the more that we can think about how we're these commonalities that we're discussing, that we can package those up and start to think about actionable items next is really important. Um, and then also there's been a big push too over the, over the pandemic for portable air cleaners. And I know you have a lot to say about that. Um, being deployed in classrooms. Um, we've seen a lot of schools not quite have that understanding of how to appropriately fit them. But now I think we're ourselves asking, what does it mean to appropriately fit a space with portable air cleaners in order to reduce the particulate load? So um, I think it's important to introduce the monitoring with the control technology and have those played together on that aspect. Jeff? Yeah, I don't have much that... I don't have much to add to that. 
other than to say, I think that the training piece is so important because um, I think a lot of people in this room look at a low cost sensor and understand that there's a huge uncertainty associated with that output. But I don't think that's well understood by most people who are using low cost sensors. So teaching people about actions to take and using low cost sensors to evaluate those actions, right? Like, oh, my CO2 is much higher than it usually is in the classroom. I can open the windows and does it go down? And I think that, that that's the specific type of training that we would get a lot of benefit at uh, from, from low-cost sensors. So, Brian, you uh, run an organization that's in charge of, say, 1,500 buildings, about. Um, so when you're going to do an IEQ measurement, what do you what, what's your objective of those three, the building, the chemistry, or the health? Well, I, uh, first of all, I'd like to echo the uh, uh, the sentiment that um, just providing data without clear direction is is actually counterproductive. Um, we have found a lot of oh, sorry. Um, in the past we have deployed um, sensors in in buildings and given our building managers a lot of data, and it's just one more thing that the building manager is now responsible for considering. And if they don't know what action to take, it then becomes something that they're never going to look at again. They don't trust uh, the, that method. Um, we have um, um, generally used um, um, sensors and monitors um, in um, building automation. Mostly what we're looking at are, are thermal comfort. I know we have a very extensive smart buildings program, uh, GSA Link, that right now is, is going through a process of trying to understand um, how to uh, do a better job of evaluating thermal comfort and, and kind of corrective actions that can be taken. What we would like to do is start to expand that a little bit to other parameters, um, carbon dioxide and particulates, I think are the ones that we're most interested in, um, to see if there are specific actions, especially if we can tie it to our automated fault detection systems, um, to say, oh, we have some sort of a spark. Is that relating to poor air quality? And if so, what actions do, can we take to, or recommend to the building manager to correct that? And does it actually yield better air quality over time? So I'd say that's really our, our focus right now. Um, yeah, yeah. Turn on. I think uh, on the on the subject of um, you know deploying sensor um, technology to help in this area, I, I think um, uh, one of the things that I know our org organization EPA is uh, trying to pay attention to is that there are fundamental operation all approaches to uh, buildings that need to be um, um, calibrated to the kind of building and the kind of use it is that are important to undertake as principal means for trying to minimize exposures and contaminants in a building. Um, and that the focus on measuring um, can sometimes detract from the attention to those basic engineering uh, kinds of controls. Um, I think that where our sense is that where we're going with the availability of, of lower cost sense, sensor technology, recognizing some of the limitations of the technology is to be able to provide clues um, to what might be going on and what actions are important to implement uh, to help reduce exposures and concentrations. Um, and, uh, um, and the work I think we're doing is uh, we, we have developed guidance over the last few years about how to think about what kinds of sensors to deploy and how to interpret data for that. And we're moving towards uh, trying to produce guidance uh, about metrics when you get certain kinds of numbers, how to think about those numbers, what clues they provide, and what actions you might take uh, to, uh, to, uh, to improve the space. So, okay, go ahead, Brent. This is the question about large scale measurements. Yeah, we're still in measurements. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> A lot of what we just talked about here was about general air quality, which is important. I, I want to bring it back to the chemistry specific element and, and 
uh, Professor Sherpin mentioned something earlier that I thought was really wise. And she said, uh, we should have more field studies that are designed by modelers. Um, and there's a lot of wisdom in that comment, as as as, as Glenn pointed out. Um, and what we can do, I think, sometimes when we're trying to understand how common processes are or, or distributions of exposures, for example, or distributions of impacts, we need distributional data on the factors that go into those impacts. So Jeff showed some great slides of here's how much runtime we see in HVAC systems. And then he raised this point at the end of how much water is left on the coil and whether that fan stays on is actually a very important parameter for certain chemistry that's happening. And we know almost nothing about how that plays out distributionally. We have some idea of when changes were happened to the equipment, okay, but but actually how that plays out in real buildings when these things, the, these pieces of equipment get installed. So a couple of simple measurements where you're just measuring literally like the fan operation and the humidity downstream of this, you know, the supply air humidity could give you that information. Right and and getting that from I don't know a thousand homes or something in different places of different vintage, different system vintages knowing the system vintage something about the technology would be immensely powerful for trying to understand these distributional impacts. Good points. Um, we we'll move on to the next question. Uh, the next big picture here is we've mentioned many times today we have millions of different spaces in the U.S. and Canada that have millions of different sources and sinks and HVAC systems and all these different indoor spaces that range widely on, on their chemistry and their impacts. From um, your perspective, let's start with, with you, Brian. What, what indoor spaces do we need to focus our research on, considering we can't do everything? And what kind of different data do we need about those spaces that, that we don't have now? Well, um, my um, my experience and my focus is mostly in, in office buildings, and there are, uh, I think is a lot of benefit to looking at, at other spaces. One one of the things that we found in a research project we did uh, called All Built for Wellbeing was that there's a lot of difference in the environments in different types of spaces within office buildings, and that smaller, higher occupancy spaces tend to be much more dynamic than an open office, for instance, where we, we could measure all day and not really see much variation in, in the things that we were measuring, carbon dioxide, particulates, TVOCs. But we saw a lot in these, these smaller spaces. So I think understanding kind of what's going on in those small dynamic spaces is, is really important. Um, I think we need a mix of um, uh, indoor environmental quality variables. I, I don't know as much about chemistry, so I haven't really talked about that. But I, I was um, really impressed with Crystal's um, discussion earlier. And kind of some, there might be some very simple measures we can take to get a better handle on that. And, and we can definitely do that with our with our, our federal community. I think we need to also be looking at certain outcome um, measures that maybe are things that we can get in a large organization. I'm thinking of things like sick leave aggregated at, at a building level. That may be something that we can we can go out and get. Um, simple um, new kind of the newest version of sick building syndrome surveys, I think they're called wellness surveys, might be something we should be deploying and, and trying to compare that to different um, operational parameters. And then at GSA and our, our smart, smart Buildings program, we collect a tremendous amount of operational data. So I think trying to measure and, and bring those, those data streams together should be a real priority going forward. Jeff? Yeah, I, I have two answers to the question. The first one is building on what Barb and then Brett said. I think that Modeling is one way of identifying when indoor chemistry is important, and that's an obvious place to target target uh, uh, measurement resources. The other answer is, I think more broadly within indoor air quality, but certainly within indoor chemistry too, we have a means of addressing kind of some of the systematic disparities that that exist, where some types of buildings and some populations uh, experience disproportionate negative effects. Uh, from indoor chemistry, and uh, 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 this is also an opportunity to to look about uh, look at uh, indoor chemistry from that lens. Not only where is it important, but but who is it important to? Um, I was going to say a lot of times those two overlap, so they happen to be the most sensitive populations that happen to be in the most you know the, the older buildings and uh, infrastructures with the less or the least amount of ventilation involved. Um, and to that end too, I think making sure that we've talked a lot about indoor outdoor characterization and how they play off of each other. I think making sure that when we do things like in schools, looking at um, indoor 
uh, air pollution measurements that we're considering the outdoors. Well, I think a lot of times that uh, when schools implement indoor monitors, they only put them indoors and they're not really thinking about outdoors. And we don't have enough necessarily in all, all locations, especially in rural locations, um, outdoor enough outdoor monitor data to kind of co-locate. So I think that's another important aspect as well. But yeah, one other thing I was going to say too, I think an important part in thinking about, um, again, I'm thinking about the school side of things is adding to that human activity survey of what teachers are doing and what students are doing in that classroom, because we can do everything possible to make that place well ventilated and, you know, have all these controls in place. But at the end of the day, if the students are spray painting by the air intake, you know, that's something we can't, there's, there's an education and a training component, not just to the building managers, not just to the administrators, but we really need to be working with teachers and students as well on the importance of that. I think that would uh, take a big role in improving air quality as well. Yeah, um, I'd like to pick up where you left off, Odessa, and, and just talking about schools uh, a, a little bit. Um, where, where I sit, um, uh, sort of uh, trying to implement and drive policy and policy change, um, I'm, I'm always fascinated at um, how often I run into what seems like common sense from a policy perspective isn't what drives uh, change um, and big change. It's it's often some landmark thing, um, some, uh, and it's like a pandemic and how that can affect how people think about things. Um, uh, or some uh, important development in the science that is the buzz in the, in the community and, um, the uh, and and so when I when I think about schools, uh, first of all, on sort of the baseline, EPA is doing a lot, uh, and our and our programs are designed to influence what happens, the design and construction phase, what happens by facility managers, what teachers do, what administrators do, what the community does, what how kids should you know how to help kids do the right thing in the schools. Um, to improve indoor air. Um, but there's this other thing about the massive investment that's needed, particularly in school infrastructure in disadvantaged communities. And um, what goes on with chemicals and chemistry uh, in buildings, I think is one of those places that can contribute to our understanding of how much we need to improve um, the infrastructure and the operations within uh, schools, particularly in uh, in disadvantaged communities, and uh, so the the translating uh, the re first investing in research uh, around uh, indoor chemistry in school buildings, and then translating that effectively into the findings and what the implications of that are, and I think that one of the things that's very underestimated in the US and other places is the enormous economic and productivity impacts that um, poor indoor air in schools has on kids for a lifetime um, and, uh, and what the societal impacts of that are. And so sort of the socioeconomic research on this, I think is very important too. Okay, um, that was a good transition. Um, we have in the US roughly 60 million people going to a school every day. Um, and we have we have data that um, small studies, you know, 10 to 50 classrooms that show increased performance uh, in classrooms with better ventilation, increased uh, a decreased illness, absences and things like that. So indicating that we should get very good um, benefits from, from improving ventilation in schools. Um, I live in Montgomery County here in Maryland, and we just installed, not we, sorry, the school district there just installed 10,000 indoor air quality monitors that monitors, among other things, CO2. And one of the things that we uh, I did, I had my colleague do, um, was look at some of the one day CO2 measurements and compare that with past school performance. And 
those historical data should indicate that there should be a good trend there, but it's really just it just comes out as a as a snap as a, a shotgun. And so, starting with you and Odessa, what are the challenges to really implement these large scale interdisciplinary field campaigns that can actually show these health effects that are you know that are limiting our ability to give guidance to actually say this is what you need to do with that data. So what are what are the how do we turn this big massive data set into something that Brian can and David can go out and say this is what you should do. I think the big discussion today is like, are the low cost sensors necessarily picking up the components that might be impacting those scores? One, maybe it's not air quality necessarily driven. It's a complex ecosystem education spaces. So thinking through all of these other factors of you know, where is it located? What are the other impacts um, involved in performance outcomes? So that's a that's a tricky one. Um, I would also say there was more discussion too about more carefully characterizing the buildings that we're looking at. So if we're looking at bulk amounts of data, is that representing necessarily the building characteristics that we need to be concerned about in different types of spaces and different regions and how those spaces are being used? So that's a tough one. Um, I would also say, I keep going back to the training because it's so important. How are people engaging with that space in a way that makes sense to, to effectively manage that building? And I think that's something we, we really need to understand more of like, what are those barriers for making those decisions based off of the research that we're doing here, our findings. So actually taking our findings and giving the guidance and then that guidance actually being put into practice. But to answer your question on the low cost sensor stuff, I think we need to do uh, more on co-locating more instrumentation around it and saying, can we make those larger conclusions based off of just what those, those measurements are coming out with? Jeff? Yeah, I was just going to say that I think that one of the things we need to do to contextualize that data is talk to the people who maintain and operate that building uh, as well, or those buildings. And what we see, for example, uh, in in other contexts, for example, long-term homes in Ontario, that a very good predictor of COVID death rates during the pandemic was, was there uh, uh, the absence of an on-site maintenance person at a long-term care home. And so I think that there are often data like those that really help us understand the context for the chemistry um, that were, are relatively easy to collect, but we don't. And to that point, to that exact point, a lot of facility managers at a lot of schools wear multiple hats. So they just may not even be aware of what's an appropriate filter. Is it fitting correctly? Is it, can our system handle something better? Do we even have filters? Like what, what does this look like? So. I think that that is a huge part of the, the conversation. So that folds into the next question. And this is um, how do we create the connection between um, the health outcomes and, and the, the chemistry, the health out outcomes to give proper guidance to both building occupants and building managers to affect change in the indoor environment? Brian? Well, it's uh, uh, an extremely uh, important question, and I think um, from from GSA's standpoint, the way we uh, regulate how our buildings are are designed and operated is is through our facility standards, um, something we call the P100. Um, in order to change that, we need to have a specific relevant um, recommendation or standard that we want to follow, tied to a a health benefit that's been clearly articulated. That is also um, relevant to the diversity of facilities we have and the different constraints we have, and it, it uh, makes me. Uh, it, what we were just talking about, I think, is is really relevant to um, this idea that the GSA require or request from Congress a certain amount of funding each year for maintenance, and we routinely get about seventy percent or less of what we request. And over time, we've amassed a four point six billion dollar backlog in deferred maintenance. And so any kind of um, change that we suggest making has to compete with that backlog uh, for resources. And anytime we suggest something that is a cost issue, it raises um, resistance because it's just one less dollar that we have to spend on what we already know we have to, to uh, focus our O&M on. So making recommendations that are cognizant of those cost uh, impacts and concerns is really, really important. And then again, a, a clearer connection to the benefit because we spend money, hopefully, to create 
um, uh, environments that are are helpful and productive to our to our employees. But we have to show that there's that connection. Dave, do you have uh, other thoughts about what you need to make guidance? Because that's a lot what your division does in the indoor space. Um, yeah, I just want to reflect a sort of interesting dynamic uh, being here um, in this panel. Um, and Dustin, we, we talked a little bit about this when we were getting ready for today about uh, how much of the benefit would be uh, for me hearing about what other things other things are said here and being influenced by that um, in the programs uh, I carry out versus how much I might contribute to influencing things. And just sitting here on this panel and listening to the discussion today, I'm feeling like the major benefit is some of the perspectives I'm hearing and uh, and learning. But but within that, um, the um, we are we I think through our non regulatory voluntary programs at EPA um, have contributed to advancing um, uh, beneficial practices to improve indoor air uh, in buildings. Um, some of that, uh, the dynamics around our programs, I think are appropriately non-regulatory and voluntary in nature, um, particularly what happens uh, in homes and the way people live in homes. And I was thinking about Brett's uh, comments earlier about, um, you know, sort of paying it, it. It sort of pointed me towards the idea of we're trying to help with unintended, unnecessary um, um, risks that people don't want to take in our, and we didn't understand or they might not have anticipated them. Um, but there are, there are, environments, the kinds uh, that Brian's uh, responsible for and um, and in schools uh, where I think um, there are some requirements that should be in place and that kind of policy change requires the continued research and science uh, that that people in this room and and others are do are undertaking. Um, the um, I think the other reflection I have on on guidance here, I already spoke to that. I think there's some basic practices to improve indoor environments that are around appropriate and adequate ventilation, effective and efficient air cleaning, um, and source control. But then understanding what's happening in a particular building um, through uh, an improved understanding of indoor chemistry, I think, um, can help influence our guidance uh, beyond uh, beyond that. Um, I think the one other comment I'd make in this area is that um, uh, there's sort of, you know, primary reduction of chemicals through a sort of a primary exposure that I think is where most of our guidance has been. Um, and uh, this, the indoor chemistry is leading to a better understanding of kind of second order uh, exposures uh, to chemicals and particulates that I, I anticipate is gonna affect, you know, particularly what we say about understanding your particular building, your particular space and the right things to do there. Okay, thank you, Trey. Yeah, quick question. And I think it's for Dave, but perhaps for, for Brian, what are our targets and, and are this EPA and the indoor environment, you don't have regulatory authority over the indoor, at least in the home, but are there target concentrations? For example, you have the outdoor, you know, where you want to, you have targets, I think are required, but are there ones that you would consider a healthy environment? And for, you know, a certain level of CO, CO2, formaldehyde, that can give us specific areas. So whatever engineering controls you use, you know, this is a recommended level that you should uh, cling to. Brian, I think you said you or me, so go ahead. Now, um... <laughs> <laughs> I'll briefly comment. Uh, we are, um, I think, with the emergency, the emergence of low cost sensors um, uh, have been doing a lot more thinking and work over the last couple of years, uh, moving towards guidance uh, that is grounded in uh, some quantitative targets. Um, uh, and uh, I think our plan uh, is that in the coming uh, uh, near term, 
EPA is going to start saying more about quantitative metrics and what those could indicate uh, in buildings. Um, the uh, we we've had some conversations across the federal government over the last few years about about that, and there's probably not going to be single action levels. But if you see numbers like in this range, um, that could indicate this kind of thing. And here's the way you should think about that. What other um, and what actions you should look to deploy to help with that. So using them as indicators. And uh, But the only place that EPA has uh, in my program is set a non-regulatory quantitative target is for radon. But um, the sensor technology, I think, is getting uh, to the point where um, we're looking at PM, uh, fine particulates, um, CO, um, uh, uh, CO2 as an indicator of what may be happening overall in indoor environments, formaldehyde um, and others. And, and I anticipate that we'll move more into that being a supplemental piece of information in addition to doing the right things on adequate ventilation, source control, air filtration, air cleaning, another way to pay attention to and understand what kinds of interventions are needed? We'll be we'll have guidance around around that. And I would just very briefly say that um, most of the targets that um, commercial office buildings uh, are subject to are industrial hygiene based radon, um, uh, some carbon monoxide, things like that. Outside of that, it's it, the if we're looking at a measurement, it's mostly comfort based. So try to stay below twelve hundred parts per million CO two because you start noticing smells and people get headaches and things like that. We don't really have a set of targets for concentrations of CO2 particulates, et cetera, inside buildings. And that's something we'd like to start looking at, at least as a key performance indicator. Th that are health-based. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Barb, I, uh, I want to wrap this up, but I want to wrap it up with one last question. So it's okay. Um, Charlie and, and Glenn, if I finish, I just want one, as, as we're the last panel, and if we're thinking you know, what impacts we're we going to make in the next five years. When Linda calls this meeting again in 2030, and we're all, all, all up here in 2030, can you give me a 30 second answer each of what you think our successes will be as far as improving the indoor air quality in all the buildings that we have? And Brett, you're quick on your feet. So I'm going to start with you. What do you, the question is, what do we think the successes will be five years from now? in terms of how our knowledge of indoor chemical processes, indoor chemistry. Just improving the indoor environment and your stalling. Not limited to indoor chemistry. With, with our, our knowledge of indoor chemistry improves the indoor environment. Yes. Terrific. Um, I, I, I think that whenever we're talking about generic guidance, we have to think of the public health model where it has to be very simple. So the best we can do is come up with simple, Here's something you should be really careful about. Here's something you should, you know, be careful about if you're if you have a sensitive health condition. And here's something that you're not. And I think that we will. I don't know all of what those things are yet, um, but I, I think that we're going to have a much better understanding of the benefits of germicidal UV and, and where that can be applied. I think we're going to be able to cross. I think we're going to be able to cross off the chemistry concerns actually. Uh, for that one. And then I think also on the uh, chemical air cleaning, I think that there's some technologies that actually do have promise that will will gain some understanding about when they're uh, useful or, or or not. Jeff? So it, it's not clear to me if this question is what I think we will be talking about or what I hope we'll be talking about. What you about. hope. Yeah. You okay. Hope. So if it's what I hope we're talking about, I hope that indoor chemistry is kind of part of the conversation. And by that, I mean that, um, you know, that 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 a, a funding agency, for example, will consider indoor chemistry not as some weird thing, but in the in the context of of of, um, you know, what they do day to day and, and, a, and a topic like any other. Thank you, Dave. Um, so. 
overall, I'm thinking about both uh, our agency and its public health mission and uh, and overall um, uh, some of where I hope we are. And uh, I think I'd like to um, first build on what Brett said that um, that we've answered some questions about some of the technologies that we can deploy indoors uh, to uh, um, to either um, refine or add uh, to the tools that we can use to uh, improve uh, indoor environments, um, both um, through you know large funding streams uh, that are in place, as well as helping. Um, all parts of society in their residential settings. Um, the other thing I think from from my perspective is that we're able to provide, and I'm, Brett, sorry to um, plagiarize you again, um, uh, we're able to translate some of what we're learning in the research community into simple, straightforward guidance and steps that can produce public health benefits in general and impact the health, productivity, livelihood, um, lifestyle of people where they are and where they spend time indoors. Thank you. Odessa? Um, I guess with, I'm thinking about the low cost sensor part and figuring out as we learn more and more about what we can do with that data is translating it into a way that you just get automated messages that are so easy to follow direct to action, go do this and your air will be better. So I think you know, much like looking at decreases in CO2, we can now understand maybe more about our ventilation rates with just using low cost sensors. I mean, that being able to not have to do these extensive big studies would be great. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, I guess I, I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next five years, we'll have more direction about what we can measure in individual spaces that can be used as feedback to modulate our building operations in, in real time. Um, and if there are proxy measurements that kind of tell us something about what's going on with indoor chemistry, that would be really, really helpful. Um, right now, it's much more how much air are we putting in a space as opposed to what's actually going on in that space. And with that, I would like to thank the panels. And since most of us are uh, federal employees. Again, these op are opinions of our panel members, not their respective agencies. So that's our disclaimer for everybody. And so I'd like to uh, thank the panel and we will have one last little speech by Glenn to wrap this up and thank everybody for attending. Hello, everybody. Um, there's uh, been a lot that we've uh, experienced here today. I'm going to focus these comments on a few things that uh, the three of us discussed on a call last week, just to kind of some wrap up ideas and comments and thoughts. But I also made a bunch of notes on here while I was sitting listening. And so the, the, if it sounds a little disjointed, you know, that's why, or it's just me. But um, we want to make the point that over the last seven years, the Sloan Foundation supported a tremendous amount of indoor chemistry research. And this funding resulted in over 300 publication with, publications with many more to come and really advanced our understanding of what's going on, plenty of discoveries, and um, just all kinds of hypothesis generation going on. From fundamental surface chemistry to full-scale field investigations, molecular modeling to full-scale building chemistry modeling. This covered the gamut, basically all aspects of indoor chemistry you can imagine. But they're clearly, and you can see that from this conversation we've been having today, there are gaps um, in our ability to go forward, um, in part because um, we are focusing you know, on this you know, fairly narrow subject of indoor chemistry, which is appropriate for the program. That's what we wanted to do. But we would like to see this broaden uh, and marry this. All of the, the folks that we've been discussing here, it's been brought up many times, you know, uh, but I'll, I'll come to that in just a minute. But the marrying the built environment with the chemistry and exposure and health, you know, all of those things together. Um, and even, you know, this understanding of what's happening indoors uh, with what's happening outdoors, you know, with the, yeah. Um, but, the Sloan program is over. 
And it's leaving a pretty big void, at least in the chemistry part of this equation. So the question we are posing ourselves, of course, many of us, is it possible to maintain this funding level or better and broaden its scope? Um, in one area that's really made a difference was when uh, Dr. Olszewski, Paul Olszewski, um, uh, very cleverly said, I'm going to put some really good instruments in the hands of very clever people who are very productive. And this made a huge difference in the analytical component of this process. It's more of that probably should be done to advance this field that really you know, replace instrumentation, get more instrumentation into the, the hands of young, eager scientists that want to advance this field. So that's just one piece of it. Um, you can see that here um, in, you know, for example, uh, Delphine's chemicalization mass spectrometer or um, uh, uh, Dr. Pollitt's um, high resolution mass spec. You know, these are things that need to be in there in order for us to understand these spaces, even if we're deploying low cost sensors and such um, at the same time to understand other aspects of that space. So, the workshop should make it clear that we need well-defined studies that test the relationships between indoor environments, chemistry, and measurable health outcomes. We really do need to do this in a cross-cutting way, um, but the health impacts of indoor exposure are often kind of difficult to study, um, in part because the individual measures of exposure are challenging. Dr. Paul has shown us one way to do that in a very effective way, um, and they can be costly and invasive, and there may be, for example, um, they are still more costly than the traditional um, sort of epidemiological approach to looking at outdoor air pollution, where we have a ton of data from health records and things that um, aren't as uh, difficult to collect on an individual basis. Um, so we need to bring together experts, chemists, building scientists, engineers, modelers, epidemiologists, toxicologists, and others, medical doctors, um, to design such studies. And we need to do that because even if we can take this information that we collect from these spaces, relate them to health outcomes, that by itself in that silo isn't enough to um, create anything actionable. I think we've heard the word actionable many times today. And we need the to understand the sources, the mechanisms, the uh, activities of occupants, how the building operates, all of those things in order to make recommendations um, and guidance and reduce disparities. Um, so I won't go on more about this. Um, you guys have heard much about this uh, and we won't find the solution here and now about how we expand this funding scope, uh, but we can continue the, this conversation. Um, in service of this goal, the question is broadly for everybody here, but also sp more specifically for the folks that are that work for federal agencies. Um, would you benefit from a similar type of workshop that's focused on indoor air quality research it, that's put together on a more frequent basis, maybe in a more targeted way, quarterly, biannually? Um, and who would you like to see participate in these activities? And how can we leverage such meetings to create fundable collaborations? I'm open to any thoughts you have on that, Elaine? So uh, so this has been a um, fascinating workshop and heard a lot of good things on this last panel. Um, so uh, made me think about um, the whole uh, convergence research paradigm that NSF is, you know, is currently promoting. Um, and but it's been talked about broadly, and I know like there's uh, there was a ESNT article talking about convergence research and how that model, um, could work, and I see uh, I see indoor chemistry is really ripe, like where you are right now, as being um, something where that would work. So having a set of workshops with kind of that and like in mind that you'd be uh, that that would be um, go toward designing, you know, this next um, cross cutting and and um, uh, trans well transdisciplinary but convergent um, study uh, would would be really, really fascinating. And so I guess the whole point of convergence research too is you you include right up front um, at the table these these you know people that re represent 
building, you know, maintenance operators, you know, building operators, building designers, teachers, you know, what, whatever it is that we're, we're hearing are the stakeholders that should be there so that, you know, we kind of get more resolution on the sorts of comments that we just heard, right? That would, you know, so now you know what you need to have at the end come out, um, but also how those people can be engaged in the actual design and, and conduct and, and, you know, have those, you know, when you say you can't get into schools to do studies, if they're, uh, you know, the school operators are at the table from the beginning, um, you know, how, what would that look like? So I guess, I guess the point there is just maybe learning a little bit more about that convergence model. And I had learned about it through, um, this, uh, there's a NSF nanotech, uh, infrastructure, but to your point about the how expensive these um, really critical, um, you know, uh, laboratory equipment are, and needing that infrastructure now and going forward to really, con you know, really advance this this field, um, which again is going to be more and more and more important as we're working toward climate adaptation. Um, so just making making these connections and seeing where other groups of scientists have been successful um, and thinking about that would, I think, would be really beneficial. Vicki, did you want to mention something about that nanotech? Did, you, you, you had uh, mentioned this to me as well, this um, convergence research. Did you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, that, you made an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. But also even uh, the new uh, directorate within the National Science Foundation is really looking for partnerships with communities um, as well as researchers. The TIP um, directorate is a place that um, this type of research might really uh, resonate with. Um, and social scientists are really important to engage as well. I'm on the advisory committee for the National Science Foundation Environmental Research and Engineering, and I'm going to push it as a committee member, you know, thinking about this uh, issue that we're talking about now within that committee and see if they can uh, are interested in picking it up as an issue, like where do we go to further this research? Um, I think and I have so many ideas right now. I might just stay up here, sorry. Um, but even, you know, I really liked a lot of the talks today and I'm just gonna, um, Delphine uh, in particular, but everybody did a nice job. And what, what I liked about Delphine's talk was she talked about this, um, uh, the VOCs as being sort of a pot of chemistry, if you will. And then we talk about low cost sensors. And so maybe just by looking at VOCs and just trying to reduce it, what did you call it? You said, a what, what was it? it? It was a combustible fuel. It was the fuel. So let's, let's decrease the fuel. So that would just mean lowering all VOCs. And then that would lower the ones that you're measuring um, in your laboratory at, at Yale University with the, that wonderful method that you're, you've developed. So I think that the conversation has to continue um, and in this way of how to really uh, think through the, the, the barriers to continuing the research to make buildings more healthy so kids can uh, think more clearly in school. I really um, don't like the fact that um, um, these whole environmental justice issues are also part of all of this. Uh, we have people who um, are disadvantaged, and then we're putting them in a school to make them more disadvantaged. I don't see how, as a country, that's a good plan for us moving forward. I also think there's economic, uh, you know, people discuss this today, um, uh, incentives potentially um, of how to make the indoor air and indoor uh, climate better for for everybody. Anyway, you brought up some really good points, so thank you, Glenn, for letting me talk a little bit. Oh, we'll have one more comment and then we'll have to wrap up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to continue on what was said earlier about what uh, I'd like to see in the future. So I have an academic background, I did a PhD, but then now I'm in the industry uh, where I'm part of the company that deployed the sensor in Montgomery County. And um, what I see you know, every day is that we talk to schools, right? We talk to customers and they don't really know much about indoor air quality. And I come here and I learn so much. And I feel like 
I came here by chance. Someone mentioned it and I'm like, okay, I'll go. I miss, you know, research. So I came here and I feel like there's like a lack of connection between the, the industry and the people on the, you know, talk to school, whatever, and then the research world. And, uh, you know, if there's, you know, a chance for having more industry and more, you know, teachers and building operators, I think that would be amazing because, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, it needs to come together. So, Great. and by the way, I'm going to ask some of you to, for your slides, if possible, because mm -hmm. I want to be able to show it to, you know, some more customers. Thank you so Great. much. Well, we're, we're glad that you uh, came by chance. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up for us uh, since we're running a little over. On behalf of the authors of the National Academy of Sciences and, Engin and Engineering and Medicine report, our supporters here at NAS. Yes. Oh, you. Oh, here. Can you just say? <laughs> um, if you are interested in a hard copy of the report, please email Darlene uh, Rowe. Uh, she's in the back, and we will ship you the uh, hard copy. Um, okay. <laughs> I want to make sure I, I, I couldn't uh, remember exactly everything she says. <laughs> um, so in, on behalf of our of the, the writers of the reports, the support, our supporters here at NAS, our speakers, our panelists, my colleagues, Dustin and Charlie, um, we thank you for your participation and hope to see you again soon.